Hi. Hello, everyone. What an amazing turnout. Thank you very much. This is nice, isn't it, Tracy? Yeah. I'm really actually quite amazed. So, uh, I spent some of my youth in this room when it was the ballroom. And every Sunday night, we would come here. And you had to be 16, but I was like about 13. And there was big curtains hanging up. And I'm not going to tell you what went on behind those curtains, but it definitely involved Perno and black currant, as I remember. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you were born. Well, we're here today to talk about careers and uh, breaking down barriers and about access to education. And I would love to really explore your education, starting from Margate and to the present day, really. So you were born in Croydon. Yeah which I don't think many people know. Everyone thinks born and bred Margate, but you came to Margate. At what age did that become home for you? I was about three. So it was about 1966, and Margate was so cool. It was unbelievable. Arlington House had just been built. Um, Margate was absolutely packed. It was, and we were Tur with my dad's Turkish Cypriot. And the reason why we came here is because even though my dad's Turkish Cypriot, he was brought up on the Greek side of Cyprus, and all his Greek friends came here and opened up coffee bars like Pelosi's, um, all the like the sort of like you know, cool coffee bars were all run by the Greek people, Greek Cypriot people. And they said to my dad, Enver, come to Margate, it's just like Cyprus, it's like the Mediterranean. So my dad come here and opened up a hotel. And, um, and we, yeah, we lived here, but my dad went really badly, badly bankrupt in um, like 1970. And with that bankruptcy, we lost absolutely everything. And my mum and dad weren't married, so my mum had no help whatsoever. And we ended up living, squatting in a tiny cottage in Trinity Square uh, for seven years. And so we went from being quite wealthy, having a hotel, and being kind of quite cosmopolitan as well, because my dad being Turkish and everything, to plummeting to rock bottom. So we went from having a hotel to my mum working in a hotel to my mum being a chambermaid to my mum never being at home and to us spending... And then my mum worked in a nightclub at the weekends until three in the morning, two in the morning. She got home at three at night on Friday and Saturday. So we was on our own all week when she was working in the hotel and then we were on our own at the weekends on Saturday and Friday nights. So... In a way, we had absolutely no discipline whatsoever. There was never anybody there to tell us what to do. And this is you and your twin, isn't it? Yeah, me and my twin brother, yeah. So we did whatever we liked, when we liked, how we liked, and by the time we were about 13, we were kind of really radically rebellious, as you can imagine. And, uh, and by that time, we just stopped going to school. We just didn't bother going to school anymore. What was the school you went to? I went to a nice school, in a way, King Ethelbert's. So King Ethelbert's is just down the road in Birchington, and now it's one of the best schools to do art in the whole of, like, Kent. It's amazing. It's really fantastic to do art, and it was when I was there. So, um, basically, when I, when I was... There was two kinds of education. There was, like, grammar school or secondary secondary modern education. If you were thick, you went to secondary modern, and you left school at 16, and you got a job in a factory or in Margate, in a hotel, washing up, chambermaid in, or whatever. You worked within a, in a, in a tourist industry. And um, I went to King Ethelbert's, but I left school at 13, and by law, I had to go back when I was 15. Otherwise, my mum would have got in trouble with social services. I mean, you get sent a thing called a W13, which means it's a warrant for something or other, and you have to go to school at least three days a week. So I went back to school three days a week. At school, I did the basic maths, basic English, art, drama, and special PE, because I was good at sports. And I just spent, basically, by the end of it, by the time I was in the fifth year, just three days a week doing art and drama, really. I didn't, I didn't 
I just couldn't catch up on the other subjects. There was no way I was going to, like, excel at anything. So at school, there's my teachers who were really good, the drama teacher and the arts teachers thought, well, at least if she's here three days a week, she's not getting into trouble. So I'd just be at school making painting, drawing, um, writing my own little plays and performing them and everything. Oh, I'd love to read those. Yeah, and I, did, I told you, you did my, for my exam, I did a Harold Pinter request. Oh, yeah, bus that's stop. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I actually liked my three days a week at school. It was like going out, doing nice things, doing whatever I wanted to do. But the big problem, one of the reasons why I stopped going to school is because I was a really good runner really fantastic cross-country runner and I loved doing cross-country at school and around here we would do cross-country would mean you go come out of school go along the cabbage fields go down the Roman road around the corner cross the road at Westgate go down to the beach and then you'd run from half a mile along the beach and half a mile back in the sand and then you'd come back up again go along the cabbage patch and then you'd get into the school and you'd have to do a double circuit of the school field and I would start off running with my friends, quite plodding along, chatting, gossiping. We'd have a cigarette on the way or whatever. <laughs> while like, running? Yeah, whilst running. So <laughs> we'd just sort of, you know, like this, whatever, out the school, like a cigarette. And, and then we <laughs> plod along. And then my friends would carry on this sort of slope. And I would, they would sort of stop a bit and get tired. But I would just start excelling and start running and just run at my own pace. And then by the time I got down to the beach, I'd be completely on my own running. And it'd be really, you know how cold it is here. It's like it's freezing, the wind or whatever, in like October, November. And I remember looking down at my legs. My legs would be bright red from the wind or whatever. And I'd feel so good. And I'd feel my feet sinking in the sand. And I'd absolutely love it. And then by the time I come back up to the school, there'd be no one near me. And then, in the last two laps of the school field, it was a big field as well, I'd sprint it. I'd run so fast. I'd still have the energy to do it. My time would be brilliant for a 13-year-old. So I got put through to go into the... Um, Kent Championships for cross country, and I come something like 19th out of 100, and I was, it was in Canterbury. I hadn't even bothered looking at the course, I hadn't even run it, and I still come 19th, and I was 13, so I was a really, really good runner. So, why I'm telling you this is because when I used to live up, I live up in Trinity Square, the number 50 bus used to go along the seafront by the Winter Gardens and come down and go down to the harbour and it stopped in the harbour now where Pete's Fish and Chip Shop is. So I would leave my house always late and I'd see the bus shoot across the top of the road and I'd, fuck, and I'd run down the alley, which was quicker, run down the hill like oh hell and I'd just get the bus. And when I used to get the bus everyone used to go yeah she made it. So I'd be racing the bus down the hill or if I went from to get the bus at Trinity Hill, I'd get to the bottom of Trinity Hill, see the 49 come in, and then have to run uphill to Cecil Square, and it'd be the same thing. <laughs> but, of course, occasionally I would miss it. And when I'd miss the bus, I'd get into school, I'd have to get the next bus that got me in at five past nine, only five minutes late. I'd get in at five minutes late, and Mr. Tuppen, Mr. Teasdale, they go, Emin, you're late. Actually, Miss Teasdale didn't speak like that. Miss Tuppen did. Emin, you're late. And I used to go, don't call me Emin, sir. <laughs> I was being really cheeky. He go, Emin, don't mouth, don't, don't speak back to me or whatever. And make me go and do detention. And I'd, I'd actually want to go into assembly, mm. even if I was late. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me. They'd punish me. And I'd say, I didn't beat the bus today. I ran as fast as I could, but I didn't beat the bus. You know, I'm sorry, sir. Meanwhile, I was running for the school, you know, I was really good at sports, but I'd be penalised for not beating the bus. But what they didn't notice, what they didn't notice was maybe I didn't have any socks on. Maybe I had a dirty shirt on. Maybe I had stains over my tie. Maybe my hair wasn't combed properly. Maybe I had bad breath because I hadn't brushed my teeth. Maybe I smelt because I had B.O. Maybe my mum wasn't at home. Because my mum left home when we were 12 and she disappeared and we didn't know where she went. We didn't really have anyone much looking after us and we looked after ourselves. 
And I manage not only to get myself to school, but I manage to beat the bus most days. And instead of being congratulated for that, I was penalised for it. Instead of someone saying, is everything OK? No one said, is anything OK? And, it's, and then when I bunked off, started bunking off school all the time and not going, people didn't say, like, come on, you're really bright and you're a really good runner and you, that you're good at art and, or whatever. No one said those things to me. Instead, I got penalised for being different, for having a different attitude. You know, maybe I got told off for not wearing a blazer you know, stuff like that. Well, maybe my blazer was too small for me and didn't fit me, because in those days it was really quite a strict school uniform. So my whole point about education is, a lot of the time, it's crap. It's shit at school. You don't learn what you want to learn. You're not helped. You're not educated. And you're not told that you can do whatever you want to do. You're not told that, actually, it's more healthy for you to race the bus than it is not to go to school at all. You're not told, you're not helped with clean socks. I was done for shoplifting, right? In Woolworths, in Birchington, because, uh, because I was stealing some socks. Now, what 13-year-old girl steals socks? Someone should have said, why is she stealing socks? This is really peculiar, you know? I wasn't stealing mascara or a top or, or something cool. I was stealing some socks, because the socks I was wearing at school, everyone took the piss out of me because they were grey. And if anybody knows what I mean about grey socks, it means, you, in those days, it meant that the washing was all done by hand and everything, nothing was that white, nothing was that clean. And, and there was, there's all these problems with education that stem from class. And that beginning that you have, that really big beginning you have, really matters so much to what you think you're capable of doing in the future. Now, luckily for me, the school I went to let me do art three days a week. Hey, and look what happened. I'm not only one of the most successful artists, living artists, I'm one of the most successful artists, full stop. <laughs> My turn. How did you um, how did you find the drive then for someone that had low attendance record at senior school? You knew that further education was really important to you because you went off and did a BTEC that was from 16 at school, and you knew that education was somewhere that you needed to be in. How did you how did you have that knowledge if you felt like well, senior school hadn't really supported that? It's, it's more complicated than that, really. So where oh, where we were. Uh, when you came in where you were earlier, where the, where the desk are for the careers advice, that used to be the garden cafe. And in the garden cafe, that's, uh, there used to be like hundreds of tables and, and, and people drinking teas and eggs and chips and God knows what else. And me and my friend Maria, we had this job where we had to just go around the tables picking up the plates and scraping the food into these great big troughs and then wheeling them out. And on... In 1977, the punks come to Margate. And when the punks come to Margate, they came into the garden cafe and they saw me and Maria working there, little punks, and they said, <laughs> you're coming with us. And we were 13, we had like red sort of short hair, we had tight drainpipe trousers on, mohair jumpers, and they took us around Dreamland and they took us on all the rides and everything and it was just brilliant. And we suddenly got this like idea that London existed, that there was these other places and these other people and there's all these things and we loved David Bowie and, and things like that. So I was always looking outside of where I was. Oh, from that moment I knew that there was this whole world out there that was really exciting, that wasn't just Margate. And I got really interested in fashion, I was really obviously totally interested in art all the way. And then when I was 15, as soon as I got the legal thing to leave school, I was 15, not 16, it was May, I got a bag with some David Bowie albums and some clothes and I moved to London and I got a job in Sasha Shoe Shop on Oxford Street. So you went and you studied fashion to begin with for your BTEC? No, it's more complicated than that, isn't it? 
but you, you dropped out of there. This was at the Medway College. You dropped out of there after a year, and you met the uh, recently expelled artist, Billy Childish, who has an exhibition right now uh, looking at paintings at Carl Friedman Gallery down the road. And you met him, and, and meeting him changed your world view of what art could be. No, but I want to say about what happened. So okay, I lived go. in London in all these spots <laughs> until I was 17 or whatever. So from 15 to 17, I did all this mad stuff in London. I'm mad, amazed that nothing bad happened to me. But in one of these squats... Well, like what, like what, though? What mad stuff? Well, I'm, well, you know, I'm surprised that I didn't get into drugs or prostitution or something really bad, but I didn't. You know, being 15 and lo moving to London on your own says disaster in great big letters. And I'm just really lucky that my interest in art and creativity led me into some really good people, which lived at Warren Street, in this squat on Warren Street, and they all went to St. Martin's and, and the Royal College of Art, and they all did art and everything. And I thought, that's really what I want to do. So I come back to Margate, went to the careers office and said, I want to be an artist. And they said, you can't. And I said, why not? And they said, because you've got no qualifications, you can't do anything. They said, you can have a job at Rovex, which is the toy train factory, or Butlins, doing washing up. So I chose Butlins, went to Butlins, worked there for half an hour, and just got my apron and went like that. And they said, where are you going? I said, I don't fucking care, but it's not here. It's not here. And I was really, and I walked out, <laughs> walked out, and I just took the fuck. And I applied for art school for foundation. This is a bit you don't know, in Medway. I applied for the foundation course, got an interview, and I got in. But I lied on the forms. I gave myself five O levels, I gave myself an A level, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, turned up with this portfolio of drawings and everything, and... Um, and you'll find in every single art course, in every single school, in everywhere, they're always looking for some wily, mouthy, working class like person that they can tick off, you know, and put into their we've helped somebody category. So I got into the foundation, it was really, really brilliant. And as I was going out the door, they said, Can you leave your certificates with the secretary? And I said, What certificates? And they said, Your 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 exam certificates. You were told you had to bring them. And at that point, I couldn't keep lying because I didn't have any. So I told them the truth, that I'd made it all up. And they said to me, what's in that basket? And I opened this basket, and it was all clothes that I'd made for myself because I was wearing clothes that I'd made. So they then got me an interview to do BTEC fashion, which oh. basically meant that you got a job working in a factory, pattern cutting, whatever, after the two years. So I did this BTEC course in fashion was really, really exceptionally bad at it for lots of different reasons and dropped out and went to Sir John Cass in London. This is for printmaking. Doing printmaking two days a week. And at St John Cass, you could go there for a pound a year and you had to be... You had to be what, is that for everybody or was that like a... No, it was for everybody then. Wow. Yeah, and it was a, a charity set up. And the reason why I knew about it was because I was listening to Joe Strummer being interviewed on the radio from The Clash, talking about Sir John Cass. And then they played London Calling, and I thought, I'm off again. So I left <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so then, yeah, no, so I, um, yeah, and that's, and that's, I, so I did this year's printmaking, then applied to a degree, degree course with no qualifications, had the worst interview in the whole world at St. Martin's, where they were just so rude to me. They, told, they said to me, you do, as soon as I walked in, they said, you do realise you're the only person we're interviewing here that hasn't got the correct qualifications? And I went, am I? And they said, yes, take a seat. I said, no, thanks. Because I just knew I wasn't going to... I just felt it was so negative. And then I had an interview at Maidstone College of Art. I had got a lift there, which had got me there at 7.30 in the morning. My interview was at 10. I waited. The dinner ladies from the college came along at, at something like 8 o'clock. They took me in, made me a cup of coffee. They made me feel comfortable. I think they even made me some breakfast or something, like some toast. And then I went for my interview at 10 o'clock to find out I was a day late. Oh... And I started crying. I was so upset. And I'd stayed up all night making myself a dress uh, out of a pair of curtains, painting my nails for my art interview, like mad. Anyway, they gave me an interview, but I had an interview for printmaking and painting. And I took the printmaking and I got in. 
and to get in on a degree course with no qualifications, leaving school at 13, was pretty brilliant. And it was the what, three of the happiest years of my life. I went into college every day, I worked so hard, and I left with, the first, with a degree with distinction. I excelled, and then I got into the Royal College of Art to do painting, which well, was really Well, can we really just difficult. talk about the printmaking then? Yeah. About how, because printmaking is such a humongous part of your practice. Do you think it's because it was such a happy time in education that you've remained making prints throughout your career? I think I loved, with, with printmaking, I loved the alchemy of it. I loved all the magic of printmaking. I loved the fact that what you did, it came out, could come out completely different and there was this sort of magic with it. And the thing about painting as well, I think even though I'd got, so there's a hierarchy within the arts, painting is really at the top. Right, and printmaking is pretty much down here. It's like seen as like a secondary subject to paint, to painting, or a secondary subject to to sculpture or to film or to whatever. But I treated printmaking like it was the like if painting is the king, then printmaking was the queen. And if we're playing chess, then the queen is going to be the strongest. You know, so to me, printmaking was really, really important, and I absolutely loved it. But when I got my, do oh, when I got finished printmaking, I decided that I had to learn to paint. So I wanted to go to the Royal College of Art to learn to paint. And when I had my interview there, they said uh, afterwards they told me that they unanimously decided to give me a place, even though I would definitely out of all the students they'd ever interviewed, I turned up with the worst paintings ever. And that's why I'd got in, because my printmaking was fantastic, my drawing was really good, I had lots of sketchbooks, but I couldn't paint. And they said to me, why do you want to come here? And I said, because I want to learn to paint. It was that simple. It was, there was no bullshit, there was no crap, and they thought, well, she's good at everything else. Two years, she'll learn to paint and I was given a place. So, and that was two of the most horrific years I ever had in education, because at Maidstone, everything at Maidstone was taught with a sort of Marxist doctrine. It was very left-wing, and it was very politicized. And I thrived in that environment. Even though I didn't agree with everything all the time, I thrived in it, and it was really, Oh, educational in a massive, big way. It was worldly how we were taught. We weren't on a pedestal or anything, you know, in our sort of ivory towers. We were really, really connected to the world. And then when I went to the Royal College of Art, I thought I'd be more connected globally to the world because 800 people there from all over the world, you have to be the best to get there. So I thought this is going to be really exciting. But for me, it wasn't. To me, it was. I, I never felt so impoverished and so poor in all my life until I went to the Royal College of Art. Because when I saw the other people, what I call the A-level kids, who had always been the A-level kids, the people that had always had like an A-stream education, who I was, I don't mean against them personally, but when I saw how easy it was for them to get there and how hard it had been for me to get there, I felt quite embittered in a way. I had a chip on my shoulder because everything was continuously difficult for me. I had no money, I had no this, I had that, that. I had no parents' house to go home to at the weekend. I had no garage that I could paint in the holidays. I had no uncle that would give me a job filing in his office and pay me a vast amount of money so I could go on holiday for the whole of August. You know, I never had any of that stuff, and I was surrounded by people that had all of that, and it was it it hurt because not because I was I was never jealous. I never have been jealous of anything in my life, but it's like there was there's like series F paint paint right series F paint costs sixteen pound a tube. It's a cerise beautiful pink colour. I would spend a day trying to mix that colour. The others would just go and buy that colour, buy that tube. And that's like a metaphor for how it was. But whilst they were just squirting it out the tube, I was learning how to make the colour. So at the end of the day, when I left, I left learning so much to take with me, whether I wanted it or not, I'd learnt it. And that was, I never, so I made the most of every single moment. I got a massive travel scholarship when I was there, but they wouldn't let me travel. I had to work throughout the hol holidays, getting as much paint and canvas as I needed with tutorial input. So, but that was with a tutor, an inspiring yeah, with, tutor who yeah, kind of... 
yeah, with Ken Kiff, yeah. And that's with Ken Kiff you were doing this travel scholarship and not travelling? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, and do you feel like inspiring tutors like that have changed your life, have made you feel more secure in your practice? Oh, well, inspiring teachers, inspiring tutors, inspiring sympathetic people, inspiring people that can understand. Like I was just <coughs> saying earlier to some people, everyone thinks that te girls, teenage pregnancies, girls that get pregnant when they're teen teenagers, they think the girls are sick. Well, they're not. They're usually the girls that have got the highest IQs because they've matured earlier and uh, uh, before, their, before their peer groups, before the other girls. They're just actually more grown up. But nobody bothers to check that or, or test that. They just completely give them a hard time because they're teenage pregnancies when it shouldn't be like that. Someone should say, well, these girls, like, let's just give them an IQ test. Let's see. Let's see what they're interested in. Let's find out what it's about before just condemning, condemning girls. Because where, where I, my mum put me on the pill when I was 14, because I started having sex when I was 13. And my mum put me on the pill, because she knew she couldn't stop me from doing I was unstoppable, so was my brother doing whatever we wanted. So my mum, instead of like actually having to look, you know, me getting pregnant at 14, having double trouble, my mum put me on the pill when I was 14. And no matter how bad someone might think that is, my own thing is, look, my mum was sort of like an ardent feminist in lots of ways as well. Not in a trendy way, but just in her actions, what she did, being a single mum, working, everything that she did. So uh, her, that, that she gave me a lot of independence as well. So it's not necessarily a negative thing. It was quite positive because I made the most of my time in terms of, like learning, education, everything as I got older, I made the most of it. So it wasn't like, um, how can I say, um, being... It wasn't like you were entitled to it. You didn't feel entitled. You felt like you were really wanting to earn that time and yeah. use it and really not just be frivolous with it. It wasn't just like, oh, I'll do this for fun. This was your life. Yeah, I didn't sort of go, oh, I've got three A-levels. What should I do? I never did anything else in my life apart from art. Nothing. That's all I've ever done. There's an incredible story where when you left the RCA, you had to destroy all your paintings, not because you didn't like them, but because you didn't have storage. And you went and took a sledgehammer, and it was almost a performance, wasn't it? Yeah, I did it twice. So I was in the, the end of the first year. So when I had my interview at the Royal College of Art, they said to me, do you have anywhere to put your paintings that I've... And I said, no. And they said, you can leave them here. And that's how I knew they'd given me a place. So my paintings were always stored at the Royal College of Art. And they were there for about a year. And then they said that they were, there was no more room for them. They were changing the storage situation. So I was so upset that I took them outside into the courtyard. And I got a sledgehammer. And they were on wood, the paintings. I got a sledgehammer. And I smashed them all up. How many screaming. were there? about 20, <gasps> and I smashed them all up, and there was wood flying well, people everywhere. trying to stop you? Yeah, and I had the sledgehammer, so when they come to try and stop me, I was like, ah, with the sledgehammer. <laughs> <I was> going, <laughs> and, and, and I had blisters all over my hands of blood, and, and I wish we'd filmed it. It would have been amazing now. Could you imagine? I was like, and here we are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I smashed them all up, and then the next time was after I left the Royal College of Art, and in 1919, I was pregnant, Oh, 1990, it was, I'd been pregnant in 1990, but it was 1991, had no, I was in so much debt. I owed about £6,000. I had, this in 1991, so that would be like about £30,000 now. Had no income whatsoever. I'd been pregnant, I'd had a really bad fucking abortion that hadn't worked, and I'd nearly died. I was at my lowest ebb ever. I couldn't pay my studio rent, I couldn't, I was, I couldn't even eat, I didn't have any money for electricity, nothing. And so I got all my paintings from the Royal College of Art, rolled them all up really neatly. There was a skip, and mm. I just threw them in the skip. That was it. And they were quite good, some of those paintings, so I'm telling none you. Of those, none of those survived, but there is one in the collection of the RCA which was actually 
a different one because you swapped it and it wasn't until years later they realised. Oh, it's so bad, their story. So, because I've got this whacking great big scholarship as well, I've got a scholarship and I've got the travel scholarship. Was this the hardship fund? Yeah, and I've got the hardship fund. What was so, that? The hardship fund meant that you were really poor and so you were given the hardship fund. And I said, yeah, I'm really going to have that on my CV. Tracy Airman, winner of the hardship <laughs> fund, you know. Like, and I've been saying to Royal College, right, you've got to change the name of that, you know. So, um, and so uh, there aren't many people that come from really impoverished backgrounds that get to, into the Royal College of Art. It's, and that, it's, it's impo almost impossible. You have to be uh, from a, uh, a background where you had a good education, where you had a bit of space to do your A-levels, where you had books, where you had this, where you were well-balanced, you know, where you had a family that were nurturing you to get that far. There's like 20 places, 2,000 people apply for 20 places, you know. It's, it's pretty hard. And you've got to have a first or a two-one to apply in the first place. So if you think about art education, it's, it's easier to be a Hollywood actor, Russell, than it is to be, uh, <laughs> than it is to be, you know, to be an artist, to get, you know, to be, a, to be an artist anyway. But what was I saying about that? Oh, yeah, about the, the painting. painting in the collection. So yeah. they, so because of that, they chose, they could choose any painting of mine that they wanted for the collection. And they chose my favorite painting, which was a painting of both my grandmothers. So my dad's mum died in 1936 of, um, of uh, typhoid, and my grandma was still alive. So I did this painting of these two women coming together at a table, the Turkish grandmother and my, and my nanny, my English gypsy grandmother. And I love this painting. It was, to me, and it was really big. It was like about seven foot by seven foot, and it was really, really... I loved it. And that's the fucking painting they chose. So they put it upstairs in the storage racks with the, with the collection, with the paintings. And this is the really bad bit of the story. I was very friendly with Stan, who was the night watchman at college, because I always worked late. And Stan always, you know, trusted me and everything. And I knew when Stan went off for his break, like every evening, and I went into his office, I took his keys, and I went upstairs to the rack thing. It was really high as well. I got a ladder, and I, I don't know how I did it on my own. I swapped the paintings over for one I didn't like for the one I liked. Then I left college with the painting I liked, and I thought, they're not interested in my work. They're not interested in me. It's just a formality that they took that painting. You know, it's just not... It's not they don't really care about it. Anyway... Uh, um, 10, 15 years later, I'm at the Royal College of Art in the upstairs having this posh dinner and with all these gallerists from Europe and it's part of the Serpentine, a Serpentine event and they've hired the senior common room to have this really big posh dinner and I'm sitting there and as I'm sitting there, I can see this fucking painting that I did that is so bad and it's on the wall like that and everybody around me, all these European gallerists and these museum people are going oh my God, have you seen that painting? And people go, yeah, it's so bad. I mean, it's kind of hideous, isn't it? And it was my painting. And also the other thing was the painting had a line all the way down it because it was a canvas which I'd folded in four as well. So it was just an old canvas that I'd re-stretched and everything. And, and then on the back of that canvas, I put, you're not having my grandmother's I'm sorry, but I've had to take them back. And then the Royal College of Art always says now that they think next time they'll show it, they'll show it the other way around. So anyway, that will teach it. That will teach me. And then, of course, I threw all my paintings away. So the grandmother's got thrown away. Yeah. So there you are. But they're still in my head. Did you ever... Because yeah. you photographed a lot of the... Yeah, I photographed painting. everything. And have you got a, a photograph of that painting, the grandmother's? Yeah. OK. And yeah. the RCA could have said, like... They, they had first choice and you had to give over whatever yeah. work. So you couldn't say, I don't want you to have that no. one. Not after everything they'd given me either, you know. They, I'd learned to paint. I mean, it's all right. It was a fair enough swap, wasn't it? You know, they taught me how to paint. I had to give them one painting. The painting they wanted. So, and I, yeah, the one they wanted, which if I'd have left it with them, it would still be safe now in a really brilliant collection. So there's a moral. 
There is the moral. So, so for you, education now is so important, and what, what you've done and what you're doing and continue to do in Margate with your art school and your art scholarships, and now also you're building a space for young chefs to learn skills. This has been so wonderful for Margate, but for you as a person, the generosity that you're giving now to younger generations, why is that so important to you, and why have you chosen Margate to do that? Well, first of all, I think the government's months should feel ashamed of themselves. I think it's appalling what's happened with education. And, um, you know, so I've got to put my money where my mouth is. If I say, well, why don't they do something? Anyone can do it. Look, even I can do it. It means lots of other people can do it, and it definitely means the governments can do it. It doesn't matter whether it's Tory, Labour, Green, it doesn't matter who it is. But they've got to take responsibility for the future, and the future is education. We can't have a good health system if we don't have education. We can't have a good transport system if we don't have education. Everything goes back to education. And there's got to be a fairer system within education as well, because a lot of people are being radically cut out now. So, and I'm really opposed, absolutely opposed to that. And I think that education should be, there should be a much better system put in place. And, and so for me, I've opened up this artist residency in Margate and artist studios as well. We, with the local restaurants here, we're doing this um, trainee kitchen, which is going to be for um, people who are interested, young people that are interested in cooking, hospitality, uh, poultry, farming, uh, meats, uh, uh, fishing. So if you're interested in fish, you'll be sent out on trawlers, you'll be taught how to gut the fish and how to cook it from the beginning to the end. You know, every, every, everything you could, you can learn. And what we hope is that people come through there and after so many weeks, they get a job. Because we, we haven't got enough people in the area now for the hospital hospitality, the brilliant restaurants that are opening in Sanit mm. and Margate and everything, and the new hotels that are opening. They need to employ local people. So we're hoping with the trainee kitchen um, that will happen. Meanwhile, I'm also buying a series of small flats and different places in Margate, renovating them, and then making them available for young creative types who want to make their home in this area, because I really believe creativity leads to like wonderful things. People that are creative are all, usually have a good energy and a good heart and a very good community spirit. So the more creative people that come to this area, the better Margate and Sanit's going to be. And I think at the moment, I keep sort of telling people about passports from the co. I really feel that Margate's becoming this magical oasis of creativity for music, arts. You know, we need to get someone to take over the Theatre Royal, Russell, and um, you know, and we could have drama as well. We need, we, you know, we need to make it. I would love Margate to be a town of culture for 20. Uh, 2030, and I don't see why it can't be. Well, the, the final question I have for you then is, do you feel proud of what you've achieved? I haven't finished yet, I only just got oh. started. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Well, I think we can all agree that uh, Queen Tracy Emin is uh, incredibly good news, not just for Margate, but for the world, just showing what, you can, what can be achieved and through adversity, the success that you've got, and then passing it on and your generosity of spirit and financially is changing lives. Yeah, and also I'd just like to say, Russell, right, is a really well-known established actor. He's sort of had a fantastic career in America. He's, you know, globally recognised. And Russell's one of the first actors of, like, a younger generation to actually come out, be really proud of being gay, and not give a fuck about what Hollywood says. Do you know what I mean? So... And this is, is for everybody. If someone says, no, you can't do that, you just say, watch me go and do it. All right? And that's what Russell's done, and that's what I've done, and that's what all of you should do. Amazing.
<laughs> can we be really cheesy and do one of these selfies like we're at a concert, like we're Lady Gaga and that, with you all in the background? Do you yeah. want to stand up and do that? Thank you very much, everyone. This has been an amazing afternoon. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, thank you.